Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Plumfield, in Franklin County, in Illinois, me and a friend from high school, we had dirt bikes, and the only way you could get to the place with motorcycles was to go down some railroad tracks, and there at the railroad trestle, there is a small creek that ran underneath it. It was cleared off, and they used to take care of it because there are high power tension lines in there too. We were on our bikes, down by the creek, and we heard something, and we looked up. There was a small hill, about 16 feet high or so. They used to go out and climb with our bikes. And we looked up, and there was what we called in Illinois, Momo, Bigfoot. And it was squatting up and down, scratching its back on a tree. It scared us, and we hopped on our bikes and took off. It was 3 p.m., clear and warm. On to the next one. In Livingston County in Illinois, I had been bow hunting with my best friend for about four years. His dad leased a new area that was only accessible through a locked gated field. We scouted the area for roughly a month and put up two deer stands 400 yards apart where there was a lot of activity. My stand was 10 feet high in an old oak tree. I couldn't get further back off the bean field as it was heavily covered in six foot tall sycamore trees that I could not maneuver through even during the day. We arrived at about 50 minutes before sunrise, opening day. He stopped to let me out. We had the radio cranked up on the WLS, an old AM station. While I was stringing my recurved bow and putting on my coveralls, we were laughing and cutting up who was going to get the bigger deer as usual. I finally climbed up in my stand and watched as he drove off. I decided to light up a cigarette and take in the beautiful morning scenery while listening to the McDowell elevator churning that morning. About two minutes later, I heard something walking parallel behind me from the south. I kept listening and thought that it was unusual since I couldn't walk through there, period. Even during the daylight, it kept getting closer until I saw it 20 yards behind me. It was standing a good two and a half feet above the sycamore saplings and was covered in hair. He looked like a damn big linebacker with shoulder pads, with no neck. I said, who are you? And it didn't answer. My friend and myself were the only ones who had a key to this big farm with a lot of timber. We stared at each other for about four minutes. I put my cigarette out and got to my knees because it could have easily snatched me out of the stand. I was looking for branches to start climbing higher, when it started to just walk off. As soon as the sun fully lit the area and I couldn't hear him anymore, I ran to the other end of the field and jumped onto my buddy's vehicle and locked the doors. I never went back after that. I told my friend what happened, and he could tell by my looks that I was scared. It was roughly 15 minutes before sunrise, with the sun coming up behind me. Clear morning. In half field and timber, a quarter of a mile from the Vermilion River. On to the next one. My family and I were visiting my grandmother in Marion, Illinois, Williamson County for the holidays, and there was a huge blizzard. This being my first experience of heavy snow, I was amazed at how hushed and insulated it felt outside and was pleased when the forecast called for more snow, since I was fascinated by the intense quiet. As a 10-year-old boy, I warranted my own bedroom 
in the front of her small house with my parents staying in the back bedroom and my grandmother in the middle room. Several hours after going to sleep, around 2 a.m.-ish, I was awakened by the most blood-curdling scream that I could and still can imagine. In thinking critically about what I heard, the most shocking aspect was its volume and duration. Waking in the middle of the night to such a scream produced a sense of nightmare and confusion but I was distinctly aware of direction, location of the source, which was outside the window to which my bed abutted, and not under the house. I was petrified and stayed quiet and frozen in my bed for several minutes, listening for other sounds. Hearing none, I ventured out to see if others heard this, and found my parents and grandmother awake and confused but still in bed. It is worth mentioning that my parents were very sound sleepers, and since my grandmother was prone to nightmares, we were accustomed to her yelling out from time to time. Odd, I know. After recounting what I had heard to my parents, our fears were immediately dismissed by the idea that it was most likely a cat giving birth in the crawl space under the house, under my window, and that the duration and change in timber was blending of the cat noises into the howling of the wind. There are several points to which I offer conflicting evidence. The night in question was very quiet, and though it was snowing heavily, the snow was falling vertically, and the same intense muffled quiet was present. Secondly, I repeatedly listened for any further noise from the crawl space, movement, meowing, for the duration of our trip, and heard nothing. Subsequent questions to my grandmother about the cat in the crawl space yielded only quizzical looks. The next summer, I accessed the crawl space through the opening under my window and found no evidence of a cat bedding there, only rubble. Additionally, if I were a cat looking for a secure den to berth in there, there would have been many other more desirable locations further from the opening and closer to the furnace and hot water heater, which were at the other end of the house. Lastly, the morning following the incident, I went out to examine the area outside my window, and found only inches upon inches of new snow. I did not know what screamed outside my window that night, but I know that it matched almost exactly the screams and low trailing off that I have heard on various recordings of vocalizations of Bigfoot. The environment before, during, and after was that of the hush that comes during heavy snowfall. Large flakes, no wind, vertical snowfall. No drifting snow the following day, which might indicate wind. It was 2 a.m.-ish, snowing heavily but no wind, snow falling vertically and very cold. This event in the middle of a neighborhood and as such, I have dismissed it for years as something other than Bigfoot. But the recordings are so similar, and the general proximity to other encounters in the area cause me to wonder. On to the next one. In Jackson County, in Illinois, I went fishing with a friend in his boat which was an 18-foot aluminum fishing boat, to Lake Kincaid in southwestern Illinois. We trolled around the banks of the lake all morning and all day fishing for smallmouth bass just till before dark. Then my friend said, let's cruise around a while at speed. We cruised around for a while, then to a large cove across from the dam and stopped approximately 50 meters from shore. Then we both witnessed something on a rocky, brushy cliff where the brush was so thick people didn't walk, shaking the trees very violently, making grunting sounds at least 60 meters away. But we could not see what was shaking the trees. I was thinking to myself it would have to be a huge buck with antlers just crashing the trees. But then from that place, a huge rock was thrown at us and landed 15 feet from the boat, with a giant splash. From the side of the splash, this rock was at least 
5 to 10 pounds. My friend said, what the heck is that? We both knew this rock was thrown many times further than any Olympic shot putter could have thrown it, and no human could have thrown a rock that size that far. Then there was more shaking of trees, and another huge rock was thrown at us, coming very close to the boat. My friend said, let's get the heck out of here, and started the motor, and we took off. My friend has since passed away. I think a beast capable of hurling gigantic rocks that far could only be a Momo or Bigfoot. I'm sure they live around there, and could be encountered again in that area. I later saw news reports in St. Louis, where the reporter traveled to Murfreesboro on the trail of Momo sightings. He interviewed local people in the Murfreesboro area who had seen and encountered, I think he said, 25 reported sightings in the last few years. But that is what made it dawn on me what the possible explanation was for my encounter. The original sighting was at dusk on a nice, clear spring evening. On to the next one. In a legendary account, according to folklorist William Elsie Connolly, giants used to harass and threaten to exterminate the First Nations Wyandotte people in the eastern portion of the United States. The Wyandotte, of course, fought back and were able to decapitate some of the giants, but this action did not end the threat. The heads reanimated bloody, hair screaming around their faces. And those heads were known to hide in mist and fog, waiting to steal children and eat livestock, ruin crops, and cause sickness. Only fire and lightning could kill them. The story of Vladimir Klavdivich Arsenyev, the leader of a scientific expedition in the thick Hot Allen Mountains of Russia, the scientist was mapping and documenting the unexplored and temperate wilderness for the Russia Geographical Society and ended up writing a trilogy of popular books detailing his adventures. This incident was published in the 1937 volume, but we have no exact date for the sighting. Arsenyev was walking a trail with his dog when he encountered what he took to be a human sign. The dog, as often is the case in high strangeness encounters, began to growl and act as though something were wrong. It seemed that there was a large animal moving and stopping in the brush. But because of the humidity and dense fog, the explorer could not make out what was making the noise. To this point, one might think that Arsenyev had encountered the Alma, the Russian version of a Sasquatch. But the incident took an even harder turn to the strange when the explorer picked up a rock and threw it into the brush, trying to flush out whatever was moving there. He succeeded, much to his dismay. Then something happened that was quite unexpected. I heard the beating of wings. Something large and dark emerged from the fog and flew over the river. A moment later, it disappeared into the dense mist. My dog, badly frightened, pressed itself to my feet. Arsenyev stated that the creature emitted a shriek or howl as it departed. As you might expect, the geographer was puzzled and spoke about his encounter at dinner that evening. A local tribesman told the story of a man who could fly in the air. Hunters often saw tracks. Tracks appeared suddenly and vanished suddenly, in such a way that they could only be possible if the man alighted on the ground, then took off again into the air. Mount Everest has a peculiar phenomenon cited by climbers there. Climber Frank Smith wrote that he was convinced that his sighting was not an optical illusion. He was climbing approximately 200 feet above Camp 6, roughly 27,600 feet by the climber's reckoning, 
and glanced at the north ridge, he saw two curious-looking objects floating in the sky. They strongly resembled kite balloons in shape, but one possessed what appeared to be squat, underdeveloped wings, and the other a protuberance suggestive of a beak. They hovered motionless, but seemed slowly to pulsate, a pulsation incidentally much slower than my heartbeat, which is of interest, supposing that it was an optical illusion. The two objects were very dark in color and were silhouetted sharply against the sky or possibly a background of clouds. The experienced climber was all too aware of the effect that high altitude can have on the senses and put himself through a series of mental tests to be certain that he was seeing what he thought he was seeing. Unable to debunk his own sighting, Smythe started to return to his ascent when a mist suddenly drifted across. Gradually, the objects of the sighting disappeared behind it, and when a minute or two later it had drifted clear, exposing the whole North Ridge once more, they had vanished as mysteriously as they had come. It's not clear at all what both Arseniev and Smythe saw. We do not have enough details of the sightings to even conjecture, but both men, despite professional reputations to maintain, reported their encounters. Something about whatever they saw was impactful enough for them to be unable to shrug the incident off and go on with their lives. The same can be said of four Philadelphia police officers who had bizarre encounters in South Philadelphia. Patrolman John Collins and Joseph Keenan spotted what they thought was a parachute settling slowly down ahead of their patrol car. They reported that it was at the level of the treetops and seemed to be about six feet in diameter and then settled in a field nearby. The officers called for a supervisor, and Sergeant Joseph Cook and Patrolman James Casper responded. All four officers cautiously approached the object and stood a few feet from it, turning their flashlights on it. The mass gave off a purple glow, almost a mist that looked as though it contained crystals. One of the officers attempted to pick the thing up, but when he placed a hand on it, that part of the mass dissolved. Within 25 minutes, the entire substance has dissipated, leaving a slight, odorless, sticky residue. The sergeant was puzzled enough to notify local federal law enforcement, but there was really nothing left for anyone to take samples of or analyze in any way. The officers noted that the thing was so light it did not even bend the weeds on which it landed. Some people are very dedicated to their sport. The witness in this account, surfing off the coast of Oregon, is no exception. It had been so cold that the young man had broken ice off his drying wetsuit that October morning in 1986. Nevertheless, he and his buddy hit the waves at dawn and began to surf. First, Thick fog with a visibility of 30 feet or so socked the surfers in. Despite the low visibility, the witness was about 10 yards offshore in 7 feet of water, waiting for a wave to ride in. The young man noted that at the time he was 6 feet tall and solidly built from working in an auto body shop. Nevertheless, something buffed him right off his board. The surfer stated that there were three creatures and that they did not flap at all, but seemed intelligent and aware. The animals were about six feet over the water, so the witness saw them clearly and described them as about six feet tall. If they had been standing with an enormous wingspan of 16 to 18 feet, the creatures were light gray with orange fins on the back of their heads. The surfer could not ascertain whether these beings had feathers, scales, or skin, as they glided off into the fog headed north. It's also interesting to note that it seemed as though no one else on the beach, including this young man's surfing partner, appeared to see the sight. 
the witness puts it down to dense fog, but one must wonder. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!